And football for us, powered by the Inside the Birds podcast. It is brought to you by the Atlantic City Airport. Plan your next vacation now. Spirit Airlines is offering nonstop flights from Boston Atlantic City International Airport to Boston, excuse me, Atlanta, San Juan, Miami, and other exciting destinations. Visit spirit.com. Adam Kaplan is here today for football at four. We'll take a look at some of the uh, NFC East questions and issues. We'll continue on that. We've covered the uh, Giants and Cowboys today. We'll take a look at the Commanders a little bit and some questions regarding this Commanders team uh, that obviously, um, you know, we talked about division champions in the NFC East, and they have not had one in quite some time. Uh, They had one a couple of years ago, but they have been at the bottom of the barrel uh, since 1997 when we went back to how far uh, NFC championships, we went back to 97. They have the least amount of uh, NFC East championships since that time frame and you take a look back at um you know the commanders in the 80s uh in the early 90s i mean they were uh, them and you know really were the class of the division right you had uh those teams with uh, Doug Williams then Jay Schrader uh you had a different quarterback kind of leading the way for them each time they definitely uh, have been a team that has had some quarterback issues they wonder if they fix that problem with, of course, um, Carson Wentz. And we'll get into that with uh, Adam Kaplan here from uh, InsideTheBirds.com and the Inside the Birds podcast. We'll, we'll get his thoughts. You know, the, the Wentz thing, is he the answer at quarterback for this team? That is really the biggest thing. And I think a lot of people are wondering – you know, whether or not Wentz can still play. Did he have a bad year last year? The numbers said, well, he played okay. So then why did the uh, Indianapolis Colts trade him? It's one of those things where the numbers and his play didn't add up. There's been a lot of uh, questions about his um, leadership ability. They had those questions here in Philadelphia. They seem to carry over to Indianapolis to the point that Frank Reich could not really Uh, save his job out there either so I think this will be a very interesting conversation with Adam Kaplan from InsideTheBirds.com and the Inside the Birds podcast as we uh, take a uh, take a closer look now uh, at the Washington Commanders uh, and uh, InsideTheBirds.com and the Inside the Birds podcast is covering the NFC East on all Inside the Birds platforms with NFL Films guru Greg Cosell this Thursday and the following three shows after that. They will take a deep dive deep into the NFC East. We on Football at Four with Adam have looked at uh, the Eagles and the Giants and the Cowboys. And now, Adam Kaplan, it's time to take a look at the Washington Commanders. Seven and ten last year. Uh, This is a team that uh, has the least amount of NFC East championships going back to 1997. And uh, some people like this team, though. The, the roster's starting to, uh, you know, they've got some talent. I guess the quarterback would be the one spot. So let's dive into the commanders. Adam, how are you? Good. Good to talk to you, Mike. Yeah, they, they definitely are a team that's interesting. In fact, I would tell you every one of these teams in the NFC East, they have some, just a lot of interesting storylines. With, with Wentz being the Washington Commanders quarterback, you have a storyline, obviously. can he? Now he's been on three teams in three years. Can he revive his career? Is this it for Carson Wentz? That's what a lot of people have asked me. And what I would tell you is he's healthy. He played fairly well last season. We know it ended terribly. He wasn't vaccinated. Um, that cost him because he wasn't able to practice against uh, leading up to the Jacksonville game. He was terrible in that game. But, by the way, he wasn't the only one who didn't play well. Their defense didn't play well. So, anyway, uh, the Colts, they didn't want him. They wanted to get rid of him. They're very public about it. So they moved him to Washington. Washington gave up pretty good compensation. Uh Washington will have to make a decision on Wentz's contract by mid-March of next year. Uh, whether they want to trade him or, or cut him, well, obviously you'd want to trade him if you don't want him. You, you wouldn't cut him unless you absolutely had to. But if he plays well enough, he'll be back. He's got to be a better leader, no question about it. But I'll tell you this, and th- this is another fact that people didn't realize, despite Carson Wentz breaking his foot last season, uh, remember he had a, a stress fracture from an old injury and it, and it broke on him, he had surgery before the season and did wind up not missing a game. That shows a really good toughness. Uh, he's clearly better than Taylor Heineke, no matter how you slice it, who will be the backup. Rookie Sam Howell is going to be their third-string quarterback as a fifth-rounder. Heineke, by the way, is on the last year of his deal, his last extension. 
So, so how if they move on from Wentz and Heineke could be the last man standing? But they're, Mike, they're going with Wentz this season. They feel uh, they feel like they could score. Uh, Jahan Dotson's their first round receiver. They're going to have more talent around him. So I'm expecting to be a better football team than last year. Yeah, I mean Wentz is an interesting. Um, you know, when you look at last year, I mean the numbers. If I just said, "Hey, look at this guy's numbers." You wouldn't say, man, this guy, we got to get rid of this guy. I mean, 27 touchdowns and seven interceptions. I mean, he took care of the ball pretty well, something that he had trouble with in that you know, season before in Philadelphia. He threw for 3,500 yards. He took care of the ball. He had a 94 quarterback rating. Uh, so why was Indianapolis willing to, to basically give up on him? Yeah, it was a leadership issue, uh, starting with uh, owner Jim Irsay and then also uh, GM Chris Ballard backed him up on it, although Ballard was the first one to – uh, to speak, but my understanding was it was Erce the whole way who really made the call. He owns the team, and everyone was in agreement. Uh, it wasn't just the COVID issue. It was it, – it just – they didn't feel like he was the kind of leader you needed as a quarterback. Uh, you know, there were, there were questions we know in Philly about uh, once and th- that issue. But we know this. The guy's really talented. Uh, he has to understand he's, he's got to take more responsibility. Uh, for being a better leader. Everyone knows the, the number one position in professional sports. No, it's not a goalie. No, it's not a point guard. It's quarterback. This is a position that everybody leads to for you to, looks to for you to lead, and you've got to do that. You've got to take responsibility when you don't play well. When you get hurt, you've got to put it on yourself. Don't point finger at teammates. Take responsibility for everything because he's still very talented. That, that's the thing that I know about Wentz, talking to people work with him. The talent level is clearly not lost. I mean, is he the same quarterback before the, the ACL injury? Maybe not. But he's not too far away. As you said, Mike, numbers are pretty good overall. He's getting another chance here with Washington. But I will tell you, the one issue with Washington has on offense is their offensive line, particularly on the interior. They're not very good there. When the Eagles line up against Washington in week three at Washington or week 10 at home, that to me is where they can make their hit. Because you know Carson Wentz, he's not going to check it down. He's not a check down quarterback. A lot of five and seven step drops. And they they should be able to get to to Wentz because the Washington is really weak in the interior, and the Eagles' defensive line will be really really good. Now these two teams uh, obviously play twice a year. Last year the Eagles won both games. Uh, a fun fact on these two teams: the two teams have not split the season series going back to 2014. Uh, so uh, it, it, whoever gets that early game that could tell us a story about this one. It's crazy. So when I gave you that stat, Mike, I. I I always look at that stuff to see how the Eagles have done, and I kept noticing, wait a minute, no one's, they haven't had a split here in a while, and I kept going back and co- going back, and yeah, not since 2014 of, as uh, we've had a split. Every, 2015 through 2021, they someone swept each other. So, as you said, the Eagles won both games last season. Now, we know what happened. <laughs> we know what happened the year before. We particularly know what happened in Doug Peterson's last game, which is an absolute disaster when Peterson kind of mixed up uh, the playing time for – uh, for uh, Hertz there, and it it, it just it, it didn't work uh, with Zach Sud with Nate, excuse me Nate Sudfeld that that was a mistake. Uh, my understanding was the communication, but yeah, I, I would say this: if you just looked at both teams right now going forward, Eagles clearly have the better roster. You could say that the the Washington team has the better quarterback, but here's the difference in both teams: we'll stay we'll stay on offense. The Eagles now with the addition of A.J. Brown and Zach Pascal from a backup standpoint. He's a good backup, by the way. He just got pre- – he had a start last year because of injuries. He's just not a starter. He's a good backup. Plus, he knows their offense. If you looked at all the skill positions, clearly the Eagles have a better team. They're, they're offensively, uh, there's no question about it. Now, Mike, the problem with Washington, with Washington, is not that they don't have talent on defense. They do. But last year, their defense, before Chase Young got hurt at DN, they were really bad. Like, they – we all thought, I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll raise my hand, I thought they were going to be great. Oh, the f- four first-round picks on the front four, uh, the Jamin Davis was a first-rounder at linebacker, so five first-round picks in their, in their front seven. And they were terrible for uh, over half the season. They got it together, and unfortunately Chase Young tore his ACL. But they got to get better, Mike. Uh, th- this, this defense can be had. There's no question if you could protect. Um, let's look at, uh, you mentioned the defense, and, and we talked about Carson Wentz, but let's look at some of his weapons. Uh, and you got the running back. Antonio Gibson is one of those guys who, you know, I, I feel like uh, is a little bit underrated. Yeah, Gibson, unfortunately, sort of underachieved as a starting running back. You know, let's not forget, he was a slot receiver when he got to Memphis. He was a big slot, about 
220, 225. You can't, you can't be six feet or six one and be 225 and play slot. That's just not going to work. So he became a running back, and he is explosive, great straight line speed, powerful. But he's, my understanding, Mike, is the knock on him is he leaves a lot of yards on the field. He's not super instinctive. That's why they drafted Brian Robinson, a third rounder out of Alabama, who's more of an inside runner. It'll be a one-two punch. Gibson's the starter. Robinson to back him up. Uh, J.D. McKissick is back as the third down back. But the problem here is that, again, Carson Wentz has not checked the ball down. I thought it was great when Frank Reich recently told, the, it was before the end of their, their offseason in, in Indy, that for, he goes, I don't play fantasy, but I think you should pick up Naheem Hines because he's going to catch a lot of balls. Well, that's a shot at Wentz because Wentz will check the ball down. So Naheem Hines, who was bad for fantasy last year, could be pretty good there. There's your fantasy tip of the day. Okay, there you go. Antonio Gibson, maybe no. Uh, Hines, maybe yes. Uh, what about Dotson? You you kind of referenced him earlier, the yep. addition of Dotson as a wide receiver. And, and, you know, they just signed McLaurin to a huge deal mm-hmm. out there. Yeah, so McLaurin got a three-year extension. I know people are saying he should have got an A.J. Brown's contract. Yes, he's getting paid uh, $2.5 million less a year than McLaurin. I mean, then Brown, but here's the difference. McLaurin got a three-year deal, and A.J. Brown got a four-year deal. And remember, they're both drafted in the 2014 NFL draft. So, yeah, McLaurin, see, the thing with McLaurin is, I'm told, he only really plays one side. He's their X receiver. He, he's more comfortable there. Dotson will be their Z receiver, their movement receiver, and Curtis Shane will be their slot. He's really explosive. He was, a, he was with Scott Turner and Ron, Ron Rivera when they were with, with uh, Carolina, and Cam Sims is the big possession receiver. Deami Brown will be their top backup outside receiver. He's pretty good. But I, although it's close, I would choose the Ears receiver core now with A.J. Brown, obviously, um, with, Devontae, with, with Devontae Smith. No offense to Terry McLaurin. I, I, I would take Devontae Smith over McLaurin. Some people would disagree with me. Uh, but the, the, the biggest difference is the offensive line, where the Eagles have the best offensive line in football. You know, another thing about the Eagles is they're deeper. They are legit 10 deep where Washington is okay with backups. They're good at tackle. Charles Leno revived his career last year and got an extension, but the Eagles are way better in the interior. And that, that to me, when the Eagles play those two weeks, Mike, the Eagles are going to make their money, their, their defensive front versus the Washington interior of their offensive line. Right. So you look at the weakness of the line, you're not saying of the, of the commanders, you're not saying it's Carson Wentz the weakness. You're saying it's their offensive line is their problem. Correct. And that, that to me, is a difference. I know there were 7-10 and 10 last season. It's going to be hard for them to do much better. By the way, they were 7-9-1 and one against the spread. Uh, more unders than overs, 7-10 seven, seven and 10 under. So that, which, which does not surprise me because Taylor Heineke is going to get figured out. He's a really good backup, but he's not a starter. They learned that that was a bad mistake last year that they didn't draft a quarterback or acquire one who was better than Heineke. He's, a, he, he's been a great story as an undrafted free agent. Scott Turner's had him in three spots, but he's just a backup. The, Theoretically, because Wentz is way better than Heineke, they should be better. Maybe an eight or nine win team, ten if they max out. I don't see it that way. Although I would tell you again, Mike, this division, this division which we've called the NFC least, all four teams are going to be better. The Giants roster is better. The coaching is going to be better. Washington's roster is a little better. They're getting some guys back from injury, so it's going to be a more competitive division where we we don't. I don't think we'll make as much fun. At, with it as we have in years past. And by the way, they also drafted uh, Sam Howell, who he was a fifth-round pick, but, you know, there was a time, Adam, that people thought he was going to be the number one overall pick. What happened is he had a really bad final year at North Carolina. Uh, He's a better-than-average talent, but nothing special. I think what happens is, and we see this in the media, they'll say, oh, this guy, if he would have come out, he'd been a first-round pick. Most of it's nonsense. It's It doesn't work that way. First of all, that's just based on some games that you watched. That's not based on teams actually digging in and, and not only going with the, 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 the all-22, digging the players' background, injury history, and so forth. Sam Howell's not the biggest guy in the world at six foot one. You know that. By the way, that's going to be with Bryce Young. When we, when we hit the draft next year, Mike, he's a fantastically talented quarterback, but he's only 5'11", very thin frame. Teams are going to have a problem with that. Some teams will think maybe you could put some weight on. See, that's the thing. That's why you, you generally like a guy 6'3", 6'4", who's mm-hmm. a big strapping guy. You'd rather not have a smaller guy. That's why I got like, like Russell Wilson is immensely talented, but at five ten and a half, that's why he dropped. Yeah, uh, I'm not the biggest Bryce Young guy. Uh, when people talk about next year's draft, I, I same thing. A little small for my liking uh, to be the number one overall guy. I don't know. We'll we'll have to see about that. Uh, you mentioned their defense. 
Why? Why did their defense underachieve? Because I agree with you. I thought their defense was going to be a handful last year. It was disastrous, at least for the first half of the year. It got better as the year went on, but, man, they had all sorts of problems. Why? Yeah, I was I was seeing a lot of players were trying to play. It, I hate the term hero ball, but which generally refers to when guys do try to do someone else's job instead of theirs. What I'd say it's more that they try to do too much last season instead of executing the way Jack Del Rio, their defensive coordinator, uh, drew everything up. Yeah, they, they, too many individual plays by their front. You know, Jamin Davis, uh, who was their first-round pick out of Kentucky, was a linebacker, did not play particularly well. He was raw. They kind of knew it when they drafted him. Uh, he, he'll be better in year two. This is not a surprise. He was a one, really a one-year breakout player for Kentucky. He was more of a project. Uh, they're good, not great in the secondary. You'll hear Greg Cosell talk uh, about this when we, we, we just taped our show with him on Washington. You hear how he talks about the secondary. I'll give you a little nugget. Cam Carl, number 31, is one of the better safeties in the National Football League. He's a strong safety that nobody knows about. St. Juice is a tall corner, is an outside corner. William Jackson is a better man corner than zone. And there, there's some misfit parts, I think, in their secondary. That's why I think they'll be – I think if you could protect, you'll be able to get them. They're going to be somewhere around 500. I know there's 17 games, but whether they're going to get 8 or 9 wins, I think they'll be around there. Right. Wentz is going to be better for them. There's no question about it. But I think if you just evaluate their, 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 their 53-man 53, 53 projected roster, interior of the offensive line's a problem. Getting more consistency out of the running game, which was an issue because uh, Scott Turner's is a, a disciple of his dad with a power run game, Dean Passing. And you'll see Wentz throw the ball downfield. And I just don't know. Chase Young's coming off a torn ACL, number 99, who was great his rookie season. Didn't play well before he got hurt. They're very talented on the front with Deron Payne, Jonathan Allen, and Montez Sweat. Sweat's not a great pass rusher. He's not kind of lived up to being a first-round pick. Remember, he's on the fourth year of his rookie contract. And secondary-wise, they're inconsistent. So that's why, to me, they're they're, they're a middle-of-the-road team. And if you're a Washington football, if you're a Commanders fan (laughs) – you're gonna. You'll feel better. You'll feel better than about you about this team they did last year. But hopefully, all the negativity around the team will subside because uh, that that obviously has been really bad if you've been a Washington fan. But they 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 say they put all these statements out that there's more positivity around the football team. We shall see. Well, and one of their big problems is the organization's a mess. I mean, and that yep, comes from the yep. top down, right? Yeah, and look, Daniel Snyder has uh, been the most criticized owner in the National Football League in my 20 years of covering the, the, the league. Now, they say that, look, they've tried to correct all these problems. They brought in Jason Wright. You, remember, you might remember him as a Browns running back out of Northwestern. Very positive guy, very smart. He's trying to turn around the culture. I've heard it's better, but what I've told people is let's look at the next 9 to 12 months. Let's see what stories come out or positive stories going to come out or negative stories going to come out. And enough of these these statements. We don't need to see any more statements. Just – just let things go. Let things be quiet. Just run your organization organization better. And Ron Rivera, by the way, the head coach, he's got personnel control, a former Eagles uh, linebackers coach from many, a couple decades ago under Andy Reid. Ron's a very positive guy, very very sharp guy, good man. He's doing all that he can, but you can only control so much. All right. Uh, the Washington Commanders, of course, 7-10 uh, and 10 last season. They play Philadelphia Week 3 in Washington and then Week 10 here in in Philadelphia. We'll have both those games for you live on 97.3 ESPN. The Eagles won both games last year, so uh, looking to sweep the series again. Uh, Carson Wentz will be back in Philly on that Week 10 game, and you can listen to more about this Commanders team and the full NFC East on all Inside the Birds platforms with Greg Cosell from NFL Films. It drops on Thursday, and then the three shows following that on InsideTheBirds.com in the Inside the Birds podcast and all Inside the Birds platforms. Adam Kaplan, my friends, joins us here for another edition of Football at Four. Thank you, Adam. See you Friday. All right. He'll be back on Friday and uh, tomorrow. Jeff Mosher's here, Andrew DeCecco on Thursday, as Andrew and I will preview the NFC North, as uh, that will be our last division preview before we get to the East, and that'll be right here on the Sports Bash Live 97.3 ESPN Football at 4.